Welcome all. Uh, my name is George Hay. I'm Associate Editor of Reuters Breaking Views. Um, this session is all about uh, the lessons from COP21 for the finance industry, and it features a distinguished guest speaker uh, who knows the subject inside out. Um, David Pitt Watson is a financier, investor, and most usefully of all, uh, chaired the UN Environmental Finance Initiative, uh, both before and after the COP21 meeting in Paris in 2015. Um, I'm going to ask him to start by saying a few words uh, about his experiences at COP21, and then we'll move on to some questions. Um, so, David, um, thanks for joining us. Maybe I could start by asking you to lay out your thoughts on what you learned from the whole Paris process, and in addition, the role that finance can play in decarbonisation. Look, thank, thanks very much, George. I, uh, I mean, I guess if I was to start with a context, it would be that climate really matters for finance and that finance really matters for climate as well. But let me start with uh, climate really matters for finance. I mean, look, it, it, it's our job as financiers to take money from point A where it is to point B where it's needed. And uh, right now, we're not really doing that. We're not on a track towards sustainability. There's not enough being invested in green technologies and there's too much being invested in brown technologies. Uh, but if we continue to do this, uh, we've got a real problem in the finance industry. I, I was at a, a great presentation David Attenborough gave in the Guildhall in uh, London. And uh, he said, look, I don't know very much about finance, but my guess is that if you've got a climate that is out of control, then all the assumptions you make about financial assets are going to be wrong because humanity depends on us being able to have a climate within uh, uh, which uh, uh, we uh, can live. So the COP being successful as getting sustainability really matters um, a, for us to be able to do our job well. And by the way, I'd be pretty positive about the the uh, a, 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 a finance being well intentioned about wanting to do the right thing. David Attenborough didn't get just get one standing ovation; he got two standing ovations. And I promise you, people that attend presentations in the Guildhall don't usually give standing ovations uh, 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 to people. Um, so, but we've got a real question in thinking about: okay, the cops coming up. It's in Britain. It's in Scotland. It's in Glasgow. What is it that finance might like to do? And and so let me just, in answering your question, have that a bit of a background. And I'll, maybe I can talk for five or ten minutes about what I would see as being the lessons from Paris. Um, look, I'm I'm an I'm an investor. I I know a bit about investment. I am not a climate diplomat. So what I'm going to be talking about are sort of observations of what I saw in the COP process. If you're a climate diplomat, you'll probably think that what I'm saying is extremely naive. But I think if, like me, you come from finance, there might be some things I'm saying that you're saying, oh, I hadn't really thought about it that way. So I, I couch this as, as observations um, a, that, 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 I, that I hope are, are helpful. And, and maybe, maybe two or three observations. First of all, observations about the COP process. Secondly, uh, observations about what the finance industry, I think, was trying to contribute to the COP process in COP21. Um, and then maybe we can go on, George, and discuss later um, actions that might suggest for COP26. So first of all, observations on the COP. This is an extraordinary process. This is trying to pull together nearly 200 uh, countries. It's thousands of delegates. I mean, when you see the actual event itself in Paris, there's a great big hall that is the negotiation hall. And then there's side halls for negotiation. And then there's vast numbers of fringe events that are taking place, um, uh, stalls and things like that. I mean, some of them are extremely sophisticated. I remember one of them had a, a sort of a waterfall in it where the water came down spelling out that we need, you know, to do something about climate. It's, it's like a... Maybe like if you've ever been to a, a UK party political conference, only much, much, much bigger than that. Um, maybe the sort of, a, 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 if I was thinking of where have I seen something like that in Scotland, the fringe events are not a million miles different from the fringe events at the Edinburgh Festival. Uh, just lots and lots of stuff like that's going on where people are showcasing the things that they can do. That's the COP itself, but there's a long process that leads up to uh, uh, the COP of a pre-negotiation 
a, again, vast rooms of people. I remember going to one in New York, one in Abu Dhabi. They were called the ascent meetings, the ascent meetings that you go to the summit on, hundreds of people at them. Uh, sometimes the room full, sometimes like the House of Commons, one person speaking and about six people in a room that could uh, have, have, have 2,000. And, and who's there? It's the nations of the world. And, and that's a sort of, it's quite a weird thing, really, because you have some very tiny countries that maybe have a delegation of one or two people to the United Nations. You have the United States, it's got a full office block across from the UN that is that that is it. So very, very different uh, uh, resources. And of course, when they come to the COP themselves, almost all of them will be quite well delegated about the areas that they have to agree on and the areas that they can't agree on. So vast amount of work will be going on right now through the UN and more particularly through the UK's diplomatic service to make sure that we're getting agreement. The second thing is people will be in different camps so this won't be 200 nations or 190, however many it is, nations uh, uh, coming along. This will be people who are in different groups, not least because small countries need to be in different groups. And one of the big things that they're going to be discussing is not the nature of climate change and whether it's happening, it's who's responsible and how we pay for it. You know, we had the group, the G7, that was the developing countries. And it was the developing countries that were mostly responsible for Kyoto. Um, and then they decided, no, we need to make sure that the, that, sorry, the developed countries that were respons responsible for Kyoto. They then decided, but we need the developing countries in this. And the developing countries are re represented by the G77, so the 7 and the 77. And of course, the G77 are saying, listen, it's you wealthy countries that used up the carbon budget of the world. If you're telling us we can't use up any of this, you are going to help us pay for this, aren't you? And do you remember there was the 100 billion that was agreed in Copenhagen that's never quite come through? So there's there's a huge development debate that will go on uh, as part of this uh, uh, as well. And then the third thing I'd say is very few people that are in those hall will have the slightest clue how the finance world that we are used to in Edinburgh, the city of London, Wall Street, how it works and what its influence is. It, indeed, I remember one of the best things I think we did in the run up to Paris was we did some seminars for people on green bonds because we were trying to demonstrate that there is money that is available that will be invested. And we gave, the, the example we used, we got someone from Morocco who'd helped put up a, a solar power plant and then we got the investment banker that had raised the money. And then we got somebody who was a trustee of an American pension fund to say what happened was American pensioners put their money into our fund. We wanted to invest in green things. The investment banker came along with a green bond. We bought the green bond. The green bond was then used to and And suddenly the lights started switching on for, for people. Of course, we'd recognize that because that's our daily bread. But for most of the people that are going to be negotiating at the COP, I think they won't uh, understand that. So that's sort of a bit of the background. And, and I would say that given that background, while I believe the financial system is absolutely critical to climate um, in intermediating, taking money from point A where it is to point B where it's needed, and in the stewardship of companies to make sure that they're doing that as well, I think you need to recognize that it, that may not be how the delegates think about it. Um, a, a, there's a big problem that we want to solve, but they're going to be thinking about, well, who is it that's going to help me solve this? Who is it um, that's uh, going to pay for it? How much am I really willing to sign up for? And that's really where we got to in Paris, which is everybody agrees we should try and keep well below two degrees. Um, but nobody's quite clear that they're going to sign in blood for what it is that they're going to put into it. So that we have these national, nationally determined contributions. Um, we're not even meeting the nationally determined contributions and they're not big enough to get what everybody wants to happen, which is that we stay well below uh, uh, two degrees. And in a sense, it seems to me that throws responsibilities back on us in the finance industry that we need, despite the fact that we don't have regulation that's forcing us to do the right thing, that we're structuring a finance industry that nevertheless will help us put on our trajectory 
uh, um, for uh, uh, the finance industry. And I think, therefore, if you were saying, what did we do for Paris? There were really two things. One was to help encourage people to, to make a strong agreement. And then the second was to make sure that we used the opportunity of the COP to reform finance so that it was capable uh, of doing uh, uh, the job. Um, so in, in trying to get a strong agreement, for example, we did the first really big petition. It was $24 trillion saying, please do a deal that's stronger than the one that actually came out from Paris. It was suggesting that we needed to uh, uh, tax carbon and do all of those sorts of things. We very big time featured green bonds. Look, here's a mechanism that was just taking off and we tried to uh, demonstrate how that could bring money. The Morocco uh, uh, example um, I gave you. Um, and then though also we tried to uh, uh, use the opportunity to um, uh, improve um, uh, um, finance. Um, a, a, so green bonds would be an example. Uh, you may remember the TCFD, uh, Task Force Climate Financial Disclosures. That was one of the announcements uh, 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 around Paris because there was a big gap uh, in information. And, and look, I think there will be similar big opportunities in 2021. Um, at Paris, look, it was historic and we got everybody to agree to something, but we didn't get a rigorous uh, a framework in Paris. To a degree, that was kicked down the road. And it was kicked down the road for five years, as actually it will be six because of COVID. Um, and it was kicked down the road to the next COP, which would be hosted by a country that had a substantial diplomatic service, because it's the country hosts diplomatic service that has to help people get together to, 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 to reach that agreement. So 2021 is a really important uh, a COP where big decisions can be taken. And we want to be sending that message that the costly thing is not to do a deal and that there will be money there if deals are done. But if we want not to be viewed with cynicism, we also need to be and be seen to be reforming the finance industry which at best is a black box to many of the delegates and uh, to some will be seen as being one of the things that, that has created the climate crisis in the first place. So big opportunities, I think, which we can maybe discuss later in information, big opportunities in stewardship, big opportunities uh, in uh, uh, intermediation. But I, I hope that gives sort of a bit of a sense, George, of what a COP is like, how it is that um, a, a, a finance might fit in. My my best moment at the COP was one of the delegates that I'd probably seen, you know, 18 months before at one of these uh, uh, ascent meetings. And he took me aside and he said, you know, when I first saw you as a representative of finance, I thought, oh no, here's somebody who's out to stop us doing an agreement. And I realized that you're on our side. Uh, and uh, that was a real high point that the delegates understand that we are on their side for doing a strong deal um, a, a, and that we would like to see that strong deal done and that we can demonstrate that we are already doing uh, a, a good stuff to to pull all of that together. So maybe that gives a wee bit of a framework of what Paris was like. OK, well. Thanks very much, David. That was a great overview um, of what it is to be at a um, COP event. Um, I suppose um, the first thing I wanted to ask you, it was a pretty kind of obvious question, given that COP26 was supposed to be this year and um, now it's going to be next year. Um, like, just as a kind of in general terms, how does that change the game, if at all? Um, is, it, is it ultimately a help, given what you were saying about the NDCs? Um, and people not being quite there yet, or is it a kind of hindrance? I, I think it might be a help. Look, the, there are some good things that have happened since Paris um, in policy, lots in technology. Um, one of the things that's not so good is the American withdrawal from the Paris Agreement. Of and one, one can imagine how that makes these talks very difficult because America and China are the two uh, uh, very, uh, very big emitters. Maybe there could be a change in the American position as we move forward for to November. Um, 
a, a we are seeing some movement just quite recently, for example, from China that looks quite interesting. But I wonder whether on balance it isn't quite a good thing just to have that little bit more time a a maybe a little bit more mature reflection on the need that we do need to do a deal. And also, I would be struck that the British diplomatic service right now with Brexit and everything else has got exactly. so much to play. And and this this really does require the diplomatic service of the host country to be working very hard to 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 help with this and actually the host countries more generally working very hard to do it so so i think that the delay on balance is probably a good thing right and um i mean where, where before, when we were kind of at the stage of it was actually quite a long time ago now at the beginning of the year where we were expecting it to happen this year were um was did you get the sense that um the british diplomatic service was kind of limbering up to um, do what they needed to do? Um. So I, I, it's a good question and neither in Paris nor now would I have a sense of what it is that's happening. A lot a lot of it, I think, George, is, is rightly private and behind closed doors to try and pe bring people to an agreement. I, I would say, though, I think that there, there is some uh, uh, in for other parts of the government, particularly those that relate to finance, there's a bit of a limbering up that, that maybe is happening now that might have been difficult to do if we had only had um, until November 2020. So, for example, one of the things that I was quite struck by in Paris was if you'd asked me two years before the COP whether I could think of very many initiatives in France that had to do with green finance. Mm. I, uh, to be honest, I'd have struggled. Right. By the time we got to the COP, France was and remains pretty respectable centre for this. And I, I wonder whether there's, a, a, I think, an important role um, for the government to help in the coordination of finance initiatives, though some of that we can do ourselves, but mm -hmm. also just to put pressure on this is an opportunity for a, for Britain to to take a step forward. And by the way, that's for the British government. But what about the Scottish government as well? Right. Isn't there something really interesting? I'm always, I, I was born in uh, uh, Scotland, I'm Scottish, uh, 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 but I, I you know, I'm just aware, you know, Scots always go on about how they invented everything. And well, we did invent the pension fund. We did invent uh, the savings bank. You know, we did invent uh, a, 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 the investment trust. Um, a, a, it, isn't this something where Scotland could demonstrate there's so much good stuff that goes on in Scotland that it is a real centre of sustainable finance? That would right. be such an interesting thing to do and doable as well in, in, a, in a smaller country in a way that would be more difficult in a bigger country. But, but, but the UK government needs to be doing this as well as, as the Scottish government. Right. Um, well, we will come on, come on to finance um, in particular um, a little bit later, but just in terms of in terms of a kind of uh, if you're looking at um, next year for when COP26 is going to happen, what is how would you think about uh, what the kind of art of the possible, the, the horizons of possibility from this? Like you've already set up that, you know, a lot of the NDCs are not really there at the moment. And this this uh, COP26 is supposed to be a kind of step up and a, an attempt to kind of move forward. Um, but what, what can we reasonably, what would you reasonably expect in terms of um, like NDCs or, or however you would look at it? So uh, let, let, let me, so there will be a lot of people much better at this than me, George, that will be thinking about how diplomatically do we find the language that can get 190 people all to agree and, and look, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an observer of all of this. I would have thought that one of the things that you might want to go for would be the sort of announcement that Britain and Europe have already made, which is a carbon neutral buy. China's made this now announcement, carbon neutral by 2060, for example. Right. Um, that that is, makes it a little bit tighter, doesn't it? Then we're all agreed that somehow we're going to get to well below two degrees. So that, 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 that would help. I think you would then go on to 
uh, the NDCs, how do we get them to be more ambitious? Um, because it, it's easy to see what you're going to, it's really easy for me to say what we're going to be doing in 2060, because I won't be there to be responsible for it. Uh, and it's easy for politicians to say that because they're not still going to be there in 40 years time. So, so how do we make sure that everybody's NDC then is on a trajectory and a trajectory to, to sustainability? I think there'll be some push on that. But there are two other ways that uh, I, I think things could go. Um, both of which would be good and exciting. One would be to try and make these NDCs more legally binding. Right now, they are just voluntary. Um, okay. But the second one, which a uh, has all, it, it's the economist solution, and it is a very elegant solution, which is to try and get a carbon price and trading of carbon, and to try and get that globally. But to be honest, if you manage to get that by November of next year, given where, for example, the United States is, that would be quite tricky. But mm. my my guess is that that would be where the diplomatic stuff is going on. But by the way, at the same time as all of that is going on, we can't really help terribly much as financiers except to say, please do this and do it robustly and properly. There's other stuff that we could be doing in finance that would be starting to bring about the same sort of changes so that we do end up with a sustainable right. world. So on that subject, then, what, what would you say are the kind of... You, you mentioned um, earlier that... Uh, people in the, the non-financial side of the, the COP um, process might, might look at finance or might have looked at finance as a kind of black box. Um, what, what, what would be your kind of standout things that the way to kind of find for the finance sector to, to kind of show that it could help from where yeah. we are now? It seems to it strikes me that there's a number of different kind of things that banks could do, um, asset managers could do, disclosure could could achieve, but is it that is it in those kind of areas? I think we do need to do those, but they might not be the things that are most convincing to the people in the COP. So let so if I could sort of break it down into two. I think the people at the COP are going to say, where's the money coming from? Where's the hundred billion? Yeah. What, what are your development banks doing? And by the way, that is hugely important that you land that. And there's a role there, I think, as well for the private finance industry to say, look, if you can put in 10, we can put in 100. Mm -hmm. But it's complicated because it's not just a lack of money that stops us doing this. It's all sorts of lack of projects is equally a constraint on, on how it is that you do all of this. And that's the one the delegates will be looking at. But look, for those of us that know the finance industry um, and that, uh, a, that understand that a, we are providing money to companies, that we are holding the equities of companies, we know there are big gaps in what it is that we're allowing to happen. I mean, one where we've made some big progress uh, a, just in the last uh, a few weeks will be we've got to stop companies declaring a profit on assets that can only survive if we destroy the planet. I mean, that, it just, we cannot have that taking place and and how can we claim to be good citizens where we're allowing uh, uh, those sorts of practices to take place i mean we elect the directors of every company in the uk i mean if we're really serious about climate and i think we should be serious about climate this is this makes covid look like a walk in the park in terms of how big a crisis it is for the world mm -hmm. surely we should be asking that before people stand for election uh, to a board of directors that they will commit to do their best to run the company in a way that is consistent with sustainability. So there'd be stuff that we could do on stewardship. Um, we shouldn't be intermediating money to do things that are are, are, are just a, a creating more stranded assets. And we do need to be doing that support for the new green investment as well. That's that's trickier. That's the one that I started with. But but there's all this stuff, George, within the finance industry that you can see needs well, done. This is what I'm kind of really referencing on banks. Um, there's lots of publicly available disclosure on the big banks and how much the fossil fuel stuff that they finance. Um, I mean, is is kind of do you expect as part of this COP process to that kind of situation to be progressed as well? Um, there'll be more more pressure on those kind of banks to reduce their um, their funding of fossil fuels and that so, kind of area. So I hope so. 
but but if you're thinking about this, you don't want to put that or you. It's not obvious that you want to put that through anything that looks like the COP process. Right. Yeah. We're the shareholders and we're the financiers of the banks as the financiers, fund managers of the shareholders of the banks and of the companies. We ought to be doing this because it's our job to make sure that we are looking after the money of millions of pensioners. Mm. Yeah who are invested in that way, millions of account holders who have got their money at a, a, the, the bank, we shouldn't be allowing that money willy-nilly to be going into projects that we know to be unsustainable. And mm. we should be bending over backwards to try and think about how it is that we get that money towards uh, uh, projects that are sustainable. And we, we, we don't need, indeed, I wouldn't advise that you try and put that through a UN process. You can do that on your own. I would encourage the UK government to absolutely encourage every financial institution in this country to treat a, those issues seriously, but, but because it's part of their job. Mm -hmm. Just like the same as they, you know, ask a bus company to make sure the buses run on time. It, if, if it's the job of the finance industry to take the people's money from point A where it is to point B where it's needed, then we know it's not needed in stranded assets. It is needed in new green investment. Yes. We need to make a return on that new green investment, no question about that, but you've got to start to, to change that. So the information systems, the stewardship, the intermediation, all of those sorts of things, and we can do that on our own. Yeah, um, what, I mean, you mentioned that the way that your non-financial cop goer will look at this, and their, their first question will be, where's, where's the money? Where's the hundred billion coming from, um, or whatever? Um, in uh, do you have a kind of slightly more sophisticated version of an, of an answer for that? What, what, what would you what would you tell them? Because if you look across the piece at the moment, you can see things like the the European Green Deal, um, yeah. various kind of publicly led attempts to kind of create the impetus for green investment, and they are at this stage kind of ideas, but not much more than that. Yeah. And then a bit of head scratching about how it. So obviously this is something that you would have thought about. So how do you? How would you respond in this? So so look, I think it's difficult because I think that there's many countries who think that the that the wealthy countries are on a promise of a hundred billion of money. Right. Period. Grant hundred billion. By the way, if you could get a green deal for a hundred billion. It would be one of the best bargains you ever, ever, More ever. Like three trillion, I think, for the yeah. European Green Deal. So, yeah, it, 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 exactly. But but that's the Copenhagen is it, it is uh, it, it that's the deal. It would be really, really, really worth doing that if you think about how much we've been prepared to spend on a, a avoiding an economic catastrophe because of COVID. Mm. A surely you would spend the money to reach a deal that will stop us having a far worse economic catastrophe mm. um, from climate. I mean, climate just feels to me like COVID, but in much slower motion. And mm. if ever there's a lesson from COVID, it's act early to get things in place so that um, it, it doesn't go to a stage where uh, it's out of control, where the permafrost is melting. Um, yeah. So, so I think that the first thing the finance industry might do would almost be to put pressure back on the governments to say, you've got to come up with this. I think there's a second thing, though, which is the whole notion of blended plus finance, which is, look, if the governments can come up with 100 billion, can we turn that into a trillion and can we and so on and so forth? I think that probably requires some traditional thinking, but I wonder also whether it's going to require much more systemic thinking. So that what you're doing is not saying here's a project in this country here, but rather here is a country plan mm -hmm. that we are confident the government will be able to deliver upon. Here are the various projects that will all link together to make sure that this country in Africa or wherever it is, is able to go on a development path that is one that doesn't destroy uh, the climate the way the development path of uh, the UK uh, mm -hmm. uh, has contributed to, and we will be able to finance under those circumstances. So yeah. some of this is is broader, and and it kind of means that in all of this, I, I think one has to say this is not just.
private and not just public. It's trying to pull the two of those together. Mm -hmm. But I, in the meantime, if I was a financier talking to anyone who was a delegate from an African country, I'd be really modest um, right. in terms of what it is that we have achieved. And I would be, uh, it's the most foolish thing if we can't agree the climate deal because of a, 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 something about development, but but just listening to how it is that it feels from from their point of view. But in the meantime, let's get on with the stuff that even though they may not think it's terribly important, we know it's terribly important. Mm. If we have every northern company run by people that are committed to run it, consistent with Paris, we'll change the world. Yeah. So I mean, are there any? In terms, you mentioned the kind of role that government can play. Is there, is there anything that the government can, in a more kind of tangible sense, do for the finance industry, or kind of anything that they can do to help progress the kind of things you're talking about? Yeah, I, I mean, I, it, it, if if sort of this, if, if if I ruled the world, or if I was rich, yeah, that, well, that's always that question, isn't it? Um, 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 yes, it will well beyond my pay grade to. Uh, to uh, quote another politician. But um, I think what I'd do would be to take the key things that we're already seeing moving in finance, to attach yourself to those and to give them just extra momentum and extra power. Right. Yeah. So um, a, a let's think about, if we think in the field of information, um, you, you know, by the ways that, that, that um, there's, the, I think there's five work streams that the government in the UK is working on for finance right now. One is the is the 100 billion. One is blended finance, and then they've got these three R's: return, risk, and reporting. Yeah. I think I think of it. So if I take reporting, so we need to build on these announcements that we've had from the International Accounting Standards Board and from the big investors which is to say, look, from now on, climate is part of the way you calculate a profit and the assumptions that you make on climate need to be sustainable. If I was the British government, I'd say, look, this, this has to happen at some stage. Let's have that happen now. The TCFD, which is about managing climate risk, yeah, and reporting on how you cl manage climate risk, right now it's voluntary. There needs to be a timetable, doesn't there? For I mean, there's a lot, there's been a lot of talk about it being mandatory, being made mandatory at some point. But um, I mean, it, it seems uh, that I mean, it seems to me that it needs to be mandatory pretty soon, or at least to be, uh, and it needs to be the spirit of it needs to be entered into. Yeah. And um, it, neither of those things quite seem to be the case at the moment. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and also, um, I've been involved in the world of corporate governance for a, a, a since I didn't have any grey hairs, and I had more hair. Um, and I'm very struck that we've transformed corporate governance in the UK. Mm. You know, the split of chair and chief executive, the existence of three independent com uh, committees for remuneration, nomination, and audit. Mm -hmm. A a a. All of that has been achieved as good practice since the a Cadbury report and, and following reports. None of them needed to go into law. Right. Yeah, we didn't. I mean, there was a law, which was the 2006 Companies Act, but none of that is in the 2006 Companies Act. Um, but we always knew that those reforms were what the good, well-intentioned financiers knew needed to happen good, well-intentioned business people knew needed to happen, and the government agreed. Mm. So I, I think if we hadn't done, on a complier explain basis, the three committees and the split of chair and chief executive, there'd be every chance that the government would have thought they wanted to legislate it on. Yeah, right. It would have taken ages and it would have been clumsy. But we can do this ourselves as the finance industry. So we can start, and, and as the corporate, as, uh, as the business industry, we can start to say, okay, this is the way accounts are going to be done. This is the way you report under TCFD. It, mm -hmm. it, it may be that it's in three years' time that it's going to become mandatory, but we're going to be well ready for that because we're going to have done it in the next uh, a few months. Um, I, I, look, we, we know we're supposed to be stewarding companies properly. So we are going to ask people when they stand for election as a 
to the board of directors, will they run that company consistent with sustainability? If they won't, it can't be in our interest as shareholders to be electing them to that really important, powerful position. Yeah. And yeah. um, similarly, if I'm a bank, how is it that over time I'm going to reduce down to zero um, my funding of companies that are outside the limits of sustainability. So you can see how it is, George, that all of those things could happen. We can do this. The, the government supports the finance industry in doing that, just the same as the finance industry can't sign a COP deal, only the delegates can, mm -hmm. but it can really make a difference to whether right. the delegates feel confident to do it. Is the idea, I mean, obviously what we're talking about here are kind of a kind of British government um, perspectives, but as as you've mentioned, because we are leading this, we have a kind of uh, a, a key role in it. So, is the idea that right, right, even if it doesn't go into kind of legislation, the idea that if the UK government throws its support behind Absolutely. those kind of things, then that might have a trickle there and or knock on effects on other other countries as well. Do you, uh, do you think that's possible? Uh, uh, absolutely, and we should be showcasing everything that's really good that we do in this country. Mm. Yeah, and we should be learning from the showcases of other countries. Yeah, but I mean, TCFD, you mean on New Zealand has now mandated for everybody right. CFDs. Good, that's right. the, uh, the sort of step forward. Um, but but what we'd like to do would be to show some leadership. And and you can show that as the UK. And, and as I say, you can also show it as Scotland. And yeah. I think that's quite, and by the way, they must be complementary. They must, must, must be complementary. Yeah. This is the most important negotiation that there will be. Um, a, a, the, the, the future of the world really depends on having a good cop. But, but Scotland doing something, Britain doing something, and the world doing something. Yeah, we can do that. Some of it, the focus is on public sector, but some of this we can do ourselves. But but if we're supporting one another, we will get further. It, 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 it's like that delegate in Paris who said, I never I thought, oh, no, we've got the investment industry here. That's the finance industry. Here. That's dreadful. We won't get a deal. But you are on our side. That needs to be the feeling. You know, yeah. we, we, we won't have an economy if we don't solve climate. If we wait for 10 years before governments need to come in and, and, and do this in a catastrophe, the costs will be vast. I just want to ask you about um, China again. Again, like just because they're such a key player, the biggest emitter, um, and often a lot of kind of a uh, way way that this whole climate change problem is is is, is looked at is um, uh, people who are less kind of keen on doing anything about it will look to China and say, well, they're they're not going to do anything about it. They've got they're too reliant on coal and um, so how significant is the, the, the kind of recent moves that you've see, seen that because it both from a kind of doing something about it and financing it, if China really throws its weight behind um, uh, the idea of, you know, COP and or just doing something off the back of it, um, that, that's, that's a pretty big change, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, I absolutely right. And, and Luke, let's let's be be clear. There are some concerns about things that China's doing, but there's also some very positive things that China's doing, you know, in terms of investment in solar, for example, which is, sure. you know, absolutely uh, massive in China. And I remember when I took over sharing the UNEP Finance Initiative, our first conference was in Beijing because the Chinese specially wanted to demonstrate their commitment to doing this. So we should be trying to build on all of that. But of course, if the Chinese do go ahead with a building their own and financing other people's coal fire power stations um, without any carbon capture and storage, that is really highly problematic. So announcements from China that show that they are on board with trying to do their part in being able to get us to a, a, a sustainable world are terribly, terribly important. I have to say, it's in China's best interest to do that. It's in America's best interest. It's in Europe. It's in everybody's best interest to do this because um, you know, to quote Tom Lehrer, we all, what is it, we all fry together when we fry. I mean, if, if we let, if we let the, uh, 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 the climate go out of control, this really does hurt everybody. And it is uncertain if we go above two degrees that we might have a knock on effect that we then, we, we can't solve. So we do need to work on this very soon. But the Chinese announcements, I think, are good. 
Um, the European announcements have been good. Uh, the British announcements have been good, but we need to do a lot more. And America needs to come on board, and so do a bunch of other countries as well. Um, but but uh, that's what you'd like to see the public sector do at the COP. But there's also stuff we need to be getting on with in finance. Right. And so, I mean, we've, we've got kind of a year until it, it kicks off. I mean, what, what, will, what will you be focusing on in, in, in the time being? between now and then what are the kind of battles that you'll be kind of so I, yeah my 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 big one for or one of my big ones for the last little while has been this whole notion of how it is that we companies a uh, determine their profits hmm. so if i've seen one i've seen a hundred environmental programs that say we won't have all this sorted out until there isn't an incentive for companies to make a profit by doing the wrong thing. Right. And uh, I, I don't know if you've seen this, George, but we, we recently had an announcement from the International Accounting Standards Board, which sets the standards for how you calculate a profit, yeah. saying, look, a, a, when you calculate your profit, you must take climate into account. Now, if you look a year ago, um, though companies were simply ignoring this. Coal-fired power stations depreciated over 30 years, for example, other thermal plants over 60, 70 years, oil coming out of the ground in 2050 that's going to get $75 a barrel. Yeah, I mean, well, you've, that, you've seen a lot of lot of change from the oil companies, the, more of the European it's, ones in the, exactly, in, in the last it's beginning, year. It's beginning to happen. And, and then we've had this uh, initiative from the big investor organisations that's saying, right now, the ISB said that you've got to do this and you've got to show the assumptions that you've made we want those assumptions to be sustainable. Now, if we changed accounting standards all around the world, the ISB is the world outside of America, basically. But if we that just changes the incentives for private companies. It's just such an obvious thing that we'll do. It, it, this is going to happen. It, there is no question this is going to happen. But let's just do that now. Mm. So, so that would be one that I'd like to see a, 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 a done. There's others I know that are working on other reportings, the front end of the report, TCFD and so on. I wonder as well, aren't there opportunities for us on stewardship? You know, we've got this great group, Climate Action 100 Plus, mm -hmm. which a, a, if people who are listening to this and are investors are, are not a member of, become a member of it. And it's trying to address the big carbon emitter companies and say, look, you've got to give us a plan that is a sustainable plan. And I I would like to see that, and I'd like to see them being really tough on doing that because it's a bargain to get people to do this now rather than to get them to do a huge amount more in five uh, or 10 years time. And I wonder, is there more that we could do on clarity about what is it that we would call good environmental management? What are the things that we'd like companies to do? And can we please only have people standing for election if they're willing to commit to that good environmental management. So I'm not really working on that right now, George, but I think that's a big area where where we're 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 sort of there. And then some of the intermediation stuff, you know, the banks, the bonds, we've got to stop issuing loans to new projects that are brown. And then the bit that's beyond my remit and is hugely important is how do we manage to get them into green? Excellent. OK, well, um, we're almost out of time. Um, I just remains me to um, thank you for joining us and um, uh, laying out your thoughts on what will, hope, what will hopefully be a successful COP26 next year. I hope it, I hope it is, George. Yeah, and I'm, I'm a pleasure to talk to you. And um, if uh, anyone listening has any thoughts, they're very welcome to uh, to uh, send me emails with questions or chats or however it is that it's going to be. Well, thanks very much for joining us, David. Pleasure.